Hello everybody. Welcome to this advanced experiments in electronic circuitry. Today we're going to talk about input protection for the operational amplifier. We'll start by reviewing the operation of the unity gain buffer. We'll talk about why circuit protection is necessary with an emphasis on input protection. We'll explore diode clamps and then we'll describe bootstrapping, which is a method of reducing the diode capacitance. You'll certainly recognize this circuit as a unity gain buffer. It's called a unity gain buffer because the output voltage is the same as the input, because the gain of this circuit is equal to 1. This is a useful circuit for the input of many devices. For example, if you have a sensor input, since the op amp has a high input impedance, it will prevent the sensor from being loaded down, thereby increasing the accuracy of the sensor and consequently of your entire system. The question we'll try to address in this video is what happens when something goes wrong with the input? As an extreme example, what would happen if this op amp were connected to 120 volts AC? To be sure, op amps like the LM358 do have some input protective circuitry, but I'll guarantee that this op amp will not survive and it will likely destroy part of your circuit board as well, and perhaps even the power supplies. We've established that this is undesirable. Instead, we want the circuit shown below with all of the additional input protection. Here's that circuit on a breadboard. Input, output, 15 volt rail, negative 15 volt rail. The items of interest are these diode clamps here and these Zener diodes here. Before we go any further, I should mention that the circuit I'm using is derived from this handbook. I would encourage every one of you to go to Analog Devices and find this Op Amp Applications Handbook as it's a very useful reference for your analog designs. I would also encourage you to read the works of Bob Pease as some of the techniques I describe in this video are directly attributed to him. And now back to our circuit. We've already established that this is undesirable, especially if someone were to make a mistake and directly connect the op amp input to 120 volts. I know this may seem like a silly scenario. I mean, who would connect 120 volts right up to the input of an op amp? But stranger things have happened, especially in industrial environments where all the screw terminals look the same. It would be very easy to confuse an input terminal with a power terminal. Let's start by reviewing what we know. We know this is a unity gain buffer and it has a high input impedance, which is a very desirable attribute because that means that we can install resistors in series with the input without affecting the output. I did demonstrate this in an earlier video where I showed that 100K in this position did not appreciably affect the output voltage. The next thing to notice are these Zener diodes that are connected back to back. This effectively forms a 12.6 volt clamp. For example, if we had an input voltage that rose to 15 or to negative 15, the output would be clamped here at about 12.6 volts and negative 12.6 volts. Since that's true, that means the voltage at this point must be between 12.6 and negative 12.6. We now move one step closer to the input stage and we see here that the voltage is going to be clamped at negative 13.2 and positive 13.2. Again, these Zener diodes plus these two back-to-back -back diodes 
will prevent the voltage from ever going below negative 13.2 or above 13.2. Now, suppose we really did connect up to 120 volts. That means at a peak, there would be a voltage of approximately 170 volts here. Our clamp would clamp that to 13.2. The voltage here would be 12.6, which implies that our downstream devices are going to be okay. The question is, will everything else be okay as well? To answer that question, we better calculate the current. So the current is equal to 170 minus 13.2 divided by 10K, which is approximately 16 milliamps, which isn't excessive. However, we better look at the survivability of R1 and R2. Together, there will be a power dissipation of 170 minus 13.2, all multiplied by that 16 milliamps, which is a power dissipation of 2.5 watts. Keep in mind, that's a peak power. At any rate, it's certainly not trivial, and you'll have to select these two resistors to be high power devices. But that's not too difficult to do, and it's not too costly. Uh, let's look at the diodes. Are they going to survive? No concerns there, as I believe they're rated somewhere around 1 amp. And now let's look at the Zener diodes. The maximum power dissipation there would be 12 times 0 0.016, which is only 0 0.2 watts, well within the ratings of those Zener diodes. So it does look like this circuit would indeed survive an accidental 120 volts connection. Moving back to the breadboard, you can see why I've selected these resistors to be larger, because we have to get rid of the power if this circuit is inadvertently connected up to a higher voltage. Just a side note, as I'm looking at this, I'm wondering if I shouldn't have put a capacitor right here such that that capacitor would bypass half of the resistance. That might be one way to reduce the circuit's susceptibility to electrostatic discharge. But that was not the primary concern of this video. Before we analyze the circuit with an oscilloscope, we should talk about this thing right here, which is called a bootstrap. To answer what that means, I have a question for you. So if we look at this upper op amp, and if we were to put a voltmeter here, I ask you, what is the voltage reading on that voltmeter? I think you would agree that if this is an ideal op amp, there would never be a voltage on that voltmeter because the output would faithfully follow the input. Whatever the input does, the output does exactly, as far as voltage is concerned. If that's true, when we look at these diodes, we can see that the diodes are connected up more or less the same way as this voltmeter was. The diodes are connected across the output and the non-inverting input terminal. When the circuit is operating normally, the diodes will have almost no voltage across them which is a desirable attribute because that means you don't have to worry about the diode capacitance. For example, had we connected up diodes like so, that diode junction capacitance would have an undesirable effect on the circuit. But that is just not the case with the bootstrap. If there's no voltage drop across the diodes, that capacitance won't be a problem. Speaking of diode capacitance, we still have these zeners out here. They are being driven by the op amp. And the op amp, while it has a high input impedance, it has a low or relatively low output impedance, which means it can drive this diode junction capacitance with ease and the impact on the circuit is minimal. In summary, 
These bootstrapped diodes here are basically invisible as far as the capacitance is concerned, whereas these diodes out here, these zeners, aren't a problem because the op amp has no problems swinging that voltage with its low output impedance. There's certainly more to be said about this circuit. However, I'd once again refer you back to that analog devices op amps application handbook. Now that we know the theory behind the circuit, let's see how it actually operates. You are looking at the input and output of the amplifier. Both channels are set to 5 volts per division. Since this is a unity gain buffer, you can't really tell the two apart because they look identical. I'm going to go ahead and shift channel 2 ever so slightly just so you can see that it is indeed there. At this point, I'm going to increase the voltage up to 15 volts peak to peak. There's 10 and now about 15 volts peak to peak. You can see that the output didn't make it. And the reason it didn't make it is because that clamp is active. All right, so channel two, again, that's the output. You can see that it is indeed clamped. Now, I can take this further at 10 volts per division. We are sending approximately 30 volts into that op amp. I'm pretty sure that if we didn't have all of this protective circuitry, the op amp would have died. Let's see if we can go further. This is the limit of what I can do with the test equipment I'm using right now. So that's 20, 40, approximately 50 volts peak. And the circuit is operating just fine, no problems at all. And now we're back where we started. You should know that I'm using a Variac and an isolation transformer to provide the input to the op amp. The output in this case is limited. It's certainly not direct line voltage, but you can see that that op amp circuit fares quite well. I do hope you found this video useful. Please leave any questions, comments, or concerns in the space below.